aperture. My name is Emily Stewart. I'm the manager of education and engagement programs here. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. We're excited to have Pete Brooke here tonight to speak about his work at San Quentin State Prison. Uh, Pete also has a piece um, about his project prison photography in the prison nation issue of Aperture. Um, and there's copies in the back if anyone's interested. Um, tonight's program is presented in partnership with the W. G. Eugene Smith Memorial Fund and supported in part by generous donations from our board of trustees, our members, of, our members and other individuals, corporate and private foundations, including the Grace Richardson Trust and the Jane Smith Turner Foundation, and public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Um, and I'm happy to introduce Bill Hunt, who's going to give a quick introduction to Pete. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm on the board of the W. Eugene Smith Memorial Fund, a very lovely organization which does a series of grants, uh, one to a photographer to complete an ongoing documentary project that uh, somehow captures the spirit of Gene Smith. Beyond that, we have a Howard Chapnick grant that the Smith Fund's 40 years old, and it's now it's a lot of money. It's like 40 grand, so, and then we have ancillary grants, it's the best evening of uh, photography available to mankind, and it takes place in October, I think it's the 17th this year, free SBA, you want to go home and open a vein, it's so depressing, but outstanding. In addition to the Smith grants, we also do a Howard Chapman grant, which is given to a non-photographer who somehow is manifesting a project that Smith would champion. And this year, the talk in the room was so exciting because Pete Brooke got it. And I was the only one in the room who appeared to have no idea who the hell Pete Brooke was. However, I now know. And um, Aperture is a sponsor of the Smith Fund, and they let us do these Smith talks a couple times a year. And this is a good one, because I met Pete this weekend we're in a show together in Frenchtown, New Jersey. Should you be wandering around Bucks County, there's a show called The Past is Prologue, curated by Temple Smith Richardson. Richardson Smith, what are you? I never know that. Smith Richardson. It's a really cool show. <laughs> that, I can't believe I described it that way. It's like six different collections of vernacular photography. And Pete contributed his very noble and thoughtful What's the first word? Depository of, De unwanted Depository of unwanted photographs, which he solicited pictures from people that they didn't want anymore. And I didn't understand the premise because I would have wanted any of those pictures. Uh, but tonight, uh, Pete's going to talk about his work with prisoners and teaching uh, photography in prison, which is not talking, he's not teaching them how to make pictures, but he's. There's lots of thoughts about the prison system and its need for not even reform, but perhaps complete <laughs> rethinking. Disassemblage. There you go. Something simple. Um, please welcome Pete Brook. Thank you, Bill. Hi, yeah. Thanks all for coming. And thank you to Aperture Foundation and especially to Emily Stewart for um, organizing us herding cats. Um, thank you to the Eugene Smith Fund, of course, uh, for the Chapnick Grant and supporting the work that I've been doing for the past eight months. And I should, and I should also say thank you to uh, the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, who's also um, funded my work since September. So, um, I've done a lot of things over the years, but broadly I would say I've been interested in this intersection between image making and mass incarceration, between photographs and prisons, for 10 years. First as a blogger, um, who blogs anymore, I don't know, then as a writer, then as an occasional curator, and now as an educator. Um, 
I figured after seven or eight years of me writing, enough had been from my megaphone. And so I conceived of a project where I would go in and teach inside of a prison and I would ask men who are impacted by the system to be the ones to deliver the context, the analysis of photographs and to tell me and correct me in many ways what images were worthwhile of our attention on the outside specifically and which ones were junk, which ones were reliable, which ones will help us get to the urgent conversation about mass incarceration in this country. Um, does anyone want any stats? Do I need to establish how fucked we are in America? <laughs> okay. Um, one in 100 adults are behind bars in this country. Um, so I kind of stop short in describing the United States as a democracy often when that's the state of affairs. So in September, I went into San Quentin prison and I was a guest of the Prison University Project, a wonderful program that teaches uh, arts appreciation, English, math, advanced algebra, environmental justice, chemistry, um, everything you would need for an associate's degree, uh, they deliver inside San Quentin Prison. Um, I'm only one of hundreds of teachers and mentors and research assistants. Uh, there's no internet on the inside. Everything we do either has to be spoken, written, or printed out. It's a really strange place to try and deliver education and exchanging ideas. Um, but what I've found, and I think this is common to every person who's, spoke, uh, who's taught inside of a prison, is that they're the best students they've ever had. Um, so tonight I'm going to very quickly go through some thoughts which are still developing for me, like I haven't resolved everything that uh, we've done in the past eight months. Um, and I'm going to try and give an outline as best as I possibly can, you know, we're 3,000 miles away from the classroom. I've got 31 guys who I've taught in the past two semesters who aren't here. Um, I'll try and represent some of their voices as faithfully as I can. I'm going to speak for about half an hour, and then me and Bill are going to have a chat, and then just before 8 o'clock, we'll open it up for a discussion, and then we'll all go at the bar. Um, there's no <laughs> this is the best title I could come up with, um, talking photo in San Quentin prison, and that's because I... Initially, I wanted to go in there and just do a workshop and show them lots of photographs of prisons and jails and mass incarceration and get them writing about them immediately. Of course, the priority for the men inside is to get a college degree. So the Prison University Project explained that that wouldn't be possible <laughs> because they need to get college credit and those classes that are given need to meet the requirements. So they said you can teach the history of photography and if you can plug into that program what you want, then we'll support you and we'll publish the outcomes, the essays. That's still to come. I'm, I'm going on a residency next month to edit God knows how many thousand words. And then this past semester, I've been working with a smaller group of students and we are together writing a curriculum designed for high school students about mass incarceration but we're using images as the starting point for each, each lesson plan, each unit. So this is what the inside of the education buildings look like. Uh, this is the only photograph with someone in it that I know. This is Mark, he was a student of mine last year. Um, these photographs are not mine. It's really difficult to take a camera into a prison. In San Quentin, it's a little bit easier. Uh, but this is from 2016, and these are essentially promotional pictures for the Prison University Project. And we're three years on now. Uh, the things I see every day, the things that other teachers see every day, um, would be worthy of sharing. But the ability for a photographer to go in there and take the time and do something good is, is you know, Infrequent, difficult. This is the uh, this is the B building. 
This is in like a prefab um, space with two classrooms. This is the B building as well. It's an old warehouse. It's just got temporary walls. It's echoey. It's a terrible place to try and teach. And it gets hot, so the fans are on all the time. You have to make the choice between being able to hear properly or being cool. Classroom again. And like I say, these guys could still be at San Quentin. They could have graduated. They could have been released. That's less likely knowing the um, population of San Quentin. They could have been transferred elsewhere. But I just wanted to include these to give you an idea of what it looks like in the place. So prisons are an odd place, right? In the reader that I provided for the History of Photo course, I included uh, chapter three of John Berger's Way of Seeing. And there's rules about what images I'm allowed to share in my curriculum. And the general rules are no images of violence, no images of full frontal nudity, uh, you know, certainly not any female nipples. Male nipples are okay. And that extended to me having to censor out these very poor Xerox reproductions of 16th, 17th, and 18th century images. And how John Berger does paired with what was then in the 70s contemporary advertising. And me and the men joked about this. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry I have to do this. This is kind of humiliating for all of us. But if it's a choice between towing the line and not, even if the risk is very, very minimal, I'm still going to like adhere to the rules. And so I got busy with um, the paint tool. On the topic of censorship, and <laughs> censorship's a tough word, we've encountered week on week on week a difficult discussion, especially this semester when we've been trying to think of what images are useful to American high schoolers. How do we describe the system faithfully so they understand well and in a short uh, time period? And there's certain types of images a, that we can't see, but also that we can't speak to. Everything, and this is, this is just a condition, this isn't a criticism, everything that we do ultimately that will be published in the forthcoming months has to be approved by the prison. And so we're going to look at a lot of pictures tonight, um, particularly at the back end of the lecture, of horrendous violence. But those are not images that we can look at, but we have spoken about and I'll explain how we managed to do that. Um, and it was very recently, uh, there was an article published uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So, anyone know this work? Is it familiar to anyone? This is work by Deborah Luster. Deborah Luster from 1998 to 2003 um, d diligently, yeah, went through three prisons in Louisiana. She took thousands and thousands of portraits, um, as well as making a beautiful book and beautiful uh, exhibition cabinets where they were all printed out on metal. These are like um, replicated uh, tintypes. She, um, she handed out paper prints to people and they assumed a massive, massive emotional currency. Widely celebrated. Those four cabinets I described, one's in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the other three are in permanent museum, museum collections. A side of Danny Lyon, if you talk about prison photography, most people think of Deborah Luster. My guys weren't bothered about this. Neither were they bothered too much about Lewis Boltz. They had some thoughts on Lucinda Devlin, and they had some thoughts on Stephen Torlentes. I include this because I learned very quickly that everything that I had assumptions about <laughs> needed to be just put aside, and I was there to give these guys a platform and a space to discuss. So they had some thoughts on the death penalty, and then our job was to connect those thoughts with an, anal an, an analysis of the images. Uh, Lewis Boltz, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pictures of rocks and scrub. 
I had to point out that this was San Quentin. This was a series that Boltz made in 1982 on one afternoon, I assume. He was having a walk around. It's made up of 57 or 59 prints, and it's called Point San Quentin, um, which is weird because he's not on Point San Quentin. He's on Corte Madeira across the water. And that would even be if you described the place where the prison is as Point San Quentin which no map does, it's not a place. So when I put this to my students, they <laughs> concluded that Lewis Boltz was being a bit of a, um, a cheeky fella and using the name and the notoriety of the prison in order to sort of like buttress, val val verify and validate his work. But this didn't speak to them in any way as having any relation to their experience of incarceration. Any questions so far? I'll tell you now, my students, the average age is like late 40s. Um, 85, 90% of them are African American, and most of them have been inside for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Last semester, I had one student who has either been incarcerated or on parole without interruption since 1965. In October, I came to New York and I spoke to a bunch of um, New York high schoolers in schools across the city. I asked my students, what do you want me to tell um, these students when I meet them? I'm gonna speak for like 30 minutes in the classroom, they don't know me from Adam. Um, and they said, tell them how much time we've done in accumulation. And so we totted it up, and among the 27 students in the classroom, the total number of time that they had served up until that point was 501 years. So we talk about art. I had a full class, yes. Yeah. Um, so they're working, they can take as many classes as they want, they're encouraged to take it at their own pace. Most students will take two classes. Some only take one. Um, some students are bold and take four. Three is a full course load. And um, the reason that my class was fully subscribed was because there hadn't been anyone teaching any course that fitted an arts appreciation for many years. And so one of the reasons the product of that class was so quality was because they uh, were all nearing graduation. They'd, they'd already attained 100 plus credits. Um, and still, their sort of like visual literacy and their practice for talking about images was quite rudimentary, which you would expect, right? If they, it's only if you walk into a specialized high school class or college class to do so. Um, and their main priority was to get the credit. You know, I wanted to freewheel sometimes and like talk about ideas and concepts, and they're just like, I've got a lot to do with my days. Let me know exactly what the assignments require. And what I asked them to do with their final assignment, which was 50% of their mark, was to take an existing body of work, such as Lucinda Devlin's Omega Suites, which is a large series of death chambers, gas execution spaces, and research it, find out what's happening in the United States, find out what its applications are, what the moral arguments, one side or the other, where the botched executions have happened, which have happened quite frequently in recent years. Then analyze the photographs and see how those things connect. And then weave in their own personal experience. Because San Quentin houses the death row for California, so they see guys being transported in shackles through the prison maybe once every week or two when they're required to turn and face the wall. For what reason, I don't know. And that's quite a complex thing to ask any student to do, let alone guys who are new to photo history and to looking at images and talking about images. And so the art stuff required a bit more from me. Um, this is all about the prison boom and prison construction and the fact that now prisons exist in the back of beyond and in the middle of any state. Um, and 
They're largely invisible, except at night when they're required for security purposes to glow. And Stephen Torlentes calls this glow like the feedback of exile. This is in Arizona. This is the type of image that my students want to talk about. This is an image by Richard Ross, who's photographed hundreds of juvenile detention facilities over the past decade or so. It's from Los Angeles. And I temper the guys when they say they want to use images to tell kids not to make the same mistakes they did. Because of course, it's about accountability, but it's also about understanding society and how systems work and how institutional racism works and how certain systems, such as the prisons, crush people who are poor and control communities that are poor. This is a beautiful body of work by Elise Emder, who went in and photographed at distance the spaces which are designated for photographs in the visiting rooms. This is either Pennsylvania or New York. She photographed in 10 prisons in those two states. I wish I had the caption information for you. The backgrounds used to be painted murals in the visiting room. What you can see here now, uh, and this is a metaphor for me for mass incarceration, they have a choice between like eight vinyl backdrops that they can select from and choose to be photographed with their kids, with their spouse, with their parents, with their siblings in front of. I had one ambitious student who was happy to take this on. We've been talking a lot about prison labor last week and the week before. This is an image by Brian Frank. Um, there's 3,000 plus prisoners in California who fight wildfires every season. They're worth tens of millions of dollars of free and cheap labor to the state. And as climate change grips, the, these crews are going to be more and more important. I had two guys in my class who've worked on fire crews in the past, and they saw both sides. Um, they weren't quick to call it slave labor. That came out of a discussion with me. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how I carry my agenda into the prison, and sort of like I have to be cognizant of that. but they also thought it was the best work available to them during their incarceration. Especially in my class with the students I've got, but generally, you can't talk about mass incarceration without talking about race. This is an image from the late 60s by Bruce Jackson. And they were confused why prisoners would have guns. And I explained to them that back in the days, especially in the South, you had a system, the trustee system, which uh, employed trusted prisoners to effectively take on the role of the guard while huge work crews went out into the fields to grow the food for the prison population. These lines on the tower are where the uh, guns are lowered and raised. And then we talk about imagery like this, which I would say is more common, especially now where prisons are trying to put forward a more positive image where rehabilitation occurs. And at this point, I should say that San Quentin is a very, very unusual prison. It's a famous name. It's known for being violent in the past. It was it used to be a maximum security level four. Now it's a level two, which means that if the prison administration thinks you're misbehaving, you'll be shipped out immediately. Um, there's very little gang politics. Uh, there's still some drug use, but I only know about that anecdotally. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Like I say, my students don't have to come to my class. They can go to any group. They can take part in any program, sports, educational, self-help, media production. And so we talk about this, and we're like, Yes, of course, this might have a part in challenging the negative stereotypes that have existed for so, so long. But it can't only be this. 
this is too positive. And I'm like, what do you mean? And my students are saying, well, this only exists in certain places. We've not seen this during the past 20 years of our own experience. And I'm like, well, what's the contrast? And they tell me, incredible violence and stress and boredom has been the norm for us. And so in our curriculum that we're writing, we have a unit which balances positive stereotypes with the images that we just don't see, which kind of gets to the heart and the tension of my work. I want to go through very quickly three bodies of work. Two bodies of work which my students have written about in detail. Um, and the third body of work is slightly more problematic. I'll get to that. But Isadora Kozowski and Yakobi Adam have both done series on prison visitation. And beautifully shot, moments for pause, and focus on the collateral effects of mass incarceration. Um, so the title, Still My Mother, Still My Father, gets to this, right? And the, the struggle for kids who are incarcerated um, by... Uh, the struggle for kids of parents who are incarcerated is manifest and it's complex. Um, the one thing I do want to say is there's a misunderstanding out there which says that if your parent is incarcerated, the likelihood is that you have a greater chance of being incarcerated yourself. That's not true. The research cannot make a clear connection between those two things. The way we have to think about it is that children who are impacted by parents' incarceration face all sorts of other struggles and um, are on the end of negative metrics that might lead to incarceration for themselves. But simply put, just because their parents have been labeled bad people doesn't mean that they are going to be bad people as well. Incarceration doesn't lead to incarceration through generations. It's trauma through communities that will lead to a cycle of incarceration. This is Greg. Greg's brilliant. His nickname is Radio and he makes radio programs, and you can find them online with KALW, um, an NPR affiliate in the East Bay. And he really enjoyed Isadora's work, as did many of the guys. They, um, they focused on images, like the one of the boys lying on the cell floor, where they identified their own story, their own experience. And this, this is an obvious point, right? People want to talk about photography, um, or they, they, they People look at photography and want to identify themselves within it. Isadora Kozowski made these images in Florida. She visited two prisons, a female prison and a male prison. And just as an, as an aside, I would say that from the evidence of these photographs, these two prisons in Florida are doing visitation as best as they can. Maybe we'll get to why I'm interested in this issue. But briefly, if you look at America through a lens, through a prism of prisons, a lot of things start to make a lot more sense. Um, and I wish I could talk specifically about uh, the impact of incarceration on families. We don't have the time, but I'm just going to run through and I'm going to give, in this case, Joshua a platform. Outside families reassured during visits, they have the opportunity to jointly parent their child and they can help the child build a relationship with a parent they might see only once a week, month, or even year. To know that you are needed by people beyond the walls and to be able to contribute in every way you can is crucially important for any prisoner. It's not a hard sell, but it might be a leap of 
of, of faith and, and of confidence for these guys, but they feel that within their education they're doing something to improve themselves, improve their community inside, and also contribute to their community on the outside, even though some of them don't know if they're ever going to meet their community on the outside again. And one of the other things that was mentioned to me so, so often about this work was the guys knew that when they went to the visiting room on Sunday, the vast majority of visitors were going to be women. Girlfriends, wives, mothers. And they also knew that if you went to a female prison, the vast majority of visitors would be female. And they are very keen to talk about masculinity and their role as men. And the fact when the shit hits the fan and you have to step up, a lot of men from their communities who are struggling don't have the wherewithal or the financial resources or the emotional fortitude to visit their ladies. And so they want to be quite upfront about that and make amends. And in a small way, our photo history class was an opportunity for that, as all their programs are, an opportunity to speak to their, um, their experience. Here's Greg again. He could only look at these photographs and imagine what it was like 20 plus years prior when he couldn't even countenance what it would be like to be separated. And then this is uh, one I want to focus on because this in the edit I didn't pay too much attention to but Antoine was very insistent. Kozowski's photo is of a woman's hands gently touching the fingers of a hand that must belong to her daughter. The girl is laying across her left arm extending a reach toward her mother. The moment of context seems to be the focal point of the image. This is the way that connections are made, lessons are learnt, value is given, wounds are healed, and love is experienced. Viewers might think that this is just a mother spending time with her daughter tending to her nails, but this very well may be the exact moment when mother explains why she can't come home, or the moment she teaches her daughter to always love herself, or why she didn't leave because she wanted to. Antoine again. This son is not comforting a criminal, a convicted felon, a thief, a gangbanger, drug dealer, or any other negative label. He's sharing in a moment with his mother. Again, viewers should pay attention to her hands. When frustrated, we ball up our fists. When overwhelmed, we squeeze what's close. When we scream, we flex the muscles in our hands. And now focus on how relaxed and gentle her hand rests on her son's back. You know, I could have a guess at this, but I'm, I would never be in a position to assign a meaning or a reading in the same way that Antoine did in this case. I don't know if this girl's having a hard time, if she's just arrived or she's about to leave. Antoine, again, doesn't focus as I would have on the disciplining and ordering of bodies. He focuses on this touch and on the fact that this, on the visual evidence for him, seems to have been a successful visitation. Millions of visits like the ones Kozofsky depicts occur every weekend. What I appreciate most and what surprises me is the expressions of seeming abandon and happiness. Joy is hard to come by in prison, and it's certainly not the only emotion experienced in the visiting room. But these families in Florida seem to be genuinely in the moment to be enjoying profound connection and given prison many, prisoners many various experiences inside. I wish that these moments of the non-incarcerated self, these moments of temporary escape, were part of every prisoner's life. Kobe Adam. This was made in New York, in New York State. Here's a kid. He's going to go see his pops. Uh, I think this is in Brooklyn. Buses also used to pick up from Columbus Circle and from the Port Authority. Maybe some of you who are locals can identify this better than I, but I think this is Brooklyn. Um, 
Troy told me that this lady was the spitting image of his own wife and all he could think of was his failed responsibility to her in the past and the hardships that she's faced since he's been incarcerated. There's a really great uh, interview with this lady. Um, ben Benedict Cumberbatch? No. What is she? Bernadette. And she's got a double-barreled name, and it sounds like Cumberbatch. It's terrible. I've, I've misplaced that detail. This is Troy again. It gets cold in upstate New York. This is going between the bus and the visitor center. This is an incredible image. And that last paragraph, while visitation is rehabilitative in its nature, surely providing a space for legally protected visits from loved ones should be a routine part of prison operations. Joshua is aware that he had privileges in San Quentin that a lot of prisoners don't have access to, which is sort of like frequent and relaxed visitation. Dam's photography is a starting point for a bigger discussion. As much as in transit overflows with emotional content, it doesn't depict the complex underlying social deficiencies that lead to crime and punishment, nor does it depict the other struggles prisoners' families face daily. No single photography project could, but if we're to improve the bonds of family and heal society, we could do worse than start with these sensitive images of an often overlooked group in society. Boom. Good night, retiring. Um, <laughs> an absolute dream to have someone deliver an analysis such as that. And then this is the last thing I'm going to speak about. Am I okay for time, Emily? You sure? Any questions so far? I know I'm rattling through. Okay, so about uh, three weeks ago, the New York Times published a piece saying that it had come into uh, possession of 2,000 plus leaked photographs from the Alabama prison system, but it was making the decision not to publish them. Uh, it published five. It was a picture of some shanks, some pictures of uh, writing written in blood on a wall. Um, and the reasons the New York Times gave was to protect the privacy of people in the pictures, um, but also to not distribute extremely graphic material. About a week after Splinter, which is one of the Gorka assets, published 50 images. And I'm going to share six of those with you in the coming slides. Mother Jones got to grips with this issue, this, this ethical debate, to publish or not to publish. Um, answering what was the subtitle to the New York Times article. If we could see prisons, would we fix them? Of course, that decision depends on sort of like what images we're talking about and what images are out there and what images get made. And coincidentally, I gave this question as a writing prompt for my students to do over the weekend. And Mother Jones got in touch with me to ask me my opinion. And I was like, well, I've got some ideas, but if we could possibly get my students' comments into the article, that would be the best thing, right? Outside of getting Alabama prisoners or former prisoners to speak to these images, getting anyone who's impacted by the system would be better than me yapping on. And then I was very pleased to see that today the New York Times did publish a piece with reflections of four current Alabama prisons, prisoners. Um, I've yet to read it, but it's out there for you. Um, so I printed out the article without the images, gave it to my students, and away they went. And this is typical of what was seen. 
It's from a facility called St. Clair Correctional Facility. And it's in the context of a recently finished investigation and report from the Department of Justice, which under the Trump administration for the past two years has been looking at the constitutional, um, what's the word, adherence you know, in terms of conditions for prisoners and safety. And they concluded that there was no safety. There was rampant violence, which went unchecked. Um, there was cell doors, which didn't lock. There was people who committed suicide and weren't found for two days. And generally, the students thought that these images should be seen. And that was because, and understand they've not seen these. They've described images of violence that they've seen in their past. So we can talk about it, but we can't actually share the images, which is like a perversion within the classroom that I'm still getting my head around. But they thought that these images needed to be seen. Mesro. Mesro said, Brian Stevenson has said that the first step in fixing the problem is to get proximate to the problem. Attitudes towards incarceration would change if the public were asked to execute the condemned themselves or at least to lock us up every night. Black boxes is referring to how Sheila Dewan, the reporter with the New York Times, referred to prisons. She said they are the black boxes of our society. So he took up that metaphor. He said black boxes record what happens aboard an airplane and are recovered after a crash. If prisons are black boxes, then details are now being recovered after the system in Alabama crashed, including photographs. Prison black boxes will persist, and future generations will see the data in them and wonder why no one did anything to fix the problems. Um, the photographs were delivered to the Southern Poverty Law Center with a letter um, explaining that the, the person who leaked them was a correctional officer. That's not been verified. They could be also like a medical professional, a civilian who works in the prison emergency room or hospital. And this is Chan, as well as Mesro. He was the other prisoner who was quoted in the Mother Jones piece. Society has become desensitized to violence. Besides, prisoners are not people that are easily sympathized with. After all, they did commit crimes. Prisons are made to punish people. Bad people hurting or killing bad people, as seen in these photos, does not affect good people. If anything, people might think it makes the world a safer place. I can't agree. I can't disagree with his, his assessment, but I'll also acknowledge that that's pretty bleak. And so I include this for two reasons. One, it's in the news. It's right now. Just fortuitously, this past month, it's been a case study that has really focused our discussions. What gets seen? What gets made? What gets distributed? Who decides? What are the outcomes? My general position on these images are, it depends who the audience is. It depends what existing biases they bring. If you think prisoners are dangerous predators and are animals and should be locked up, then you might look at these and think, well, this proves our case. Look at them, they're butchering each other. If you think that the system is broken and abusive and failed and has been for a long, long time and can't maintain the basic human rights of those inside, then you would also look at these and it would be proof of that too. This is Sal. I saw Sal do an improv performance last week. He was brilliant. I had no idea he had improv in his back pocket. Um, he's also a great thinker. The great sadness of America is millions of its citizens shuffled in and out of its prisons. 
Information is tightly controlled. America's prisons are publicly owned and publicly paid for, yet few people have an inkling of what goes on behind. All mail to and from prisoners is read before delivery. Every letter, every birthday card, magazines and family photographs are closely scrutinized. The New Yorker and Rolling Stone magazines are sometimes deemed inappropriate and returned. Imagine your mail being opened and declared unsuitable for your reading. Imagine your every moment monitored, every word spoken listened to. Imagine what is going on in prison that you will never know. Jean's comment reflects Chan's as being skeptical, cautious. He also is a, believes in Eastern philosophy and karma in some ways. So he tends to blame the system way less than other guys have encountered. And it's tough because part of their self-improvement is about honesty and accountability. But then I'm bringing in a discussion which wants to talk about the systemic failures. So is it nature, is it nurture, is it personal choice, is it circumstance? And this is where, this is the aftermath of a fire in a cell. And I'll end with Troy. Troy was a little, he, he was a little bit upset that his comment didn't make it into the article. And it's because he's absolutely adamant. The only way anyone could ever know what goes on in prisons is, is if we all had access to a 24-7 audio and video feed of every angle in every prison and jail and locked facility in the United States, of which there's like 6,300 or more. But that's the only way we could ever know. And it's impossible and it's impractical, but it kind of speaks to the challenge that I've had, that the students have, to position what use photography is in the face of this closed and often total institution that persists partly because of its invisibility and its myth-making. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.